Able's in on air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yahad, New York and New England, where everyone belongs. The Orthodox Union. The Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired. The Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. The Montpelier Sustainable Coalition. Abel Dinonair has been seen in the following publications. Parkchester Times. New York Parrot Online Newspaper. Muslim Community Report www.thisisthebronx.info and www.h.com Ableton On Air is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences Boston, New England chapter. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. I'm on. And on this um, show, before we get to it, we would like to say special thanks to our sponsors, um, Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, and also our partners with the, with the Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired and the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired and many, many others, including partners um, such as uh, for this particular edition of Ableton On Air, we would like to thank um, the Equal Opportunity Center of the Bronx and um, the uh, Services for, Devel the, for the Developmentally Challenge of Bronx, New York. And uh, with us today, we would like to say hello to Mr. Luis Torres of um, of Services for the Developmentally Challenged of Bronx, New York. He's the Human Resources Director of, of Services for the Developmentally Challenged. Welcome, uh, Lewis, to Ableton On Air. Hey, hello, Larry. Hello, Arlene. How are you guys? Okay, how are you? Uh, I'm good, thank you. Okay. <laughs> On, uh, let's, let's begin. Uh, Lewis, um, what, um, uh, from your end, since you've been training uh, people with um, uh, people to work in the field of special needs for many years. Um, for those that don't know, um, what is a DSP, and how have they been? Uh, how has the position been dealt with during the pandemic, uh, uh, or even before the pandemic? Uh, DSP is direct support professional and for staff that works with people with varying disabilities, autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. It used to be a uh, person that was uh, now known as, that is now known as DSP, was previously known as a direct care worker. Uh, the reason for the change is because families and just administrators want to see that staff are not just caring for a person, but they're supporting a person with a disability in their hopes and aspirations to become independent or just just doing things with them in their general life and allowing them to do as much as they can do for themselves. Mm -hmm. What type of training do you do in terms of um, the classes you teach at the Equal Opportunity Center? Let's start there. Well, we, we, we cover everything from policy and procedures, uh, state regulations, uh, the different disabilities and characteristics of people with disabilities from the autism, Down syndrome, um, cerebral palsy, Prader Willie, the different disabilities, so they can know certain characteristics. The person with autism may be slightly different than the person with Down syndrome, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. same with somebody with cerebral palsy. So the more a staff understands their role and what they should do and what they should look for, um, the better it is that they'll be successful in helping that person become more independent 
and actually even learn from what, more for themselves because the funny thing about life Larry is this we actually think that we're teaching them the reality is, is that they're teaching us to help them become more successful um, you being a human resources director has have you noticed high turnover in the field of special needs or being a DSP well yes yeah. Uh, I've seen a high turnover rate because of different things. I mean, the issue with the pandemic and people afraid to be in contact with others, uh, the low wages that come in, the demands of the job. Um, and one of the things that once you get into human resources, you know, one, one of the things that you learn is that the reason that people, the high turnover rate, the reason that people leave their job is because of lack of proper supervision. So there are a number of things. It's not usually one thing, but recently... Wages have been an issue because there are more demands placed on the DSP, um, the community at large, parents, families, uh, the state. They want DSPs to integrate individuals into their community in, in a bigger way and be, to be more meaningful. And that's a, that's a challenge, and that takes a lot of work. Mm. So do you, do you think people are more afraid also to work with people with disabilities? Why or why not? Not so much afraid. Um, maybe the need to understand what their roles are. It can't, but it can be a little intimidating. I wouldn't use the word afraid. And maybe some people are intimidated because if you're, if you're coming into this work as a DSP, direct support professional, and then you're taking an individual with a behavior out into the community, and that, be, and that individual exhibits in the behavior in a store or out about in the community. You know, and then the, so the question becomes, is that staff properly trained to help not just the person, but also to help that community understand what's going on? Because it, it shouldn't just be one individual. It should be also that the community also understands and knows what's going on in the life of that person. So there are different challenges at this point because the state – and families want the person to be out in their community more and more. Arlene, did you want to ask any? I'm sure you have some questions. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. How long have you been teaching this uh, training? The training I started almost over 20 years ago because previously I was a residence manager, and I saw that my greatest resource was the staff and having staff who were well-trained and understood the work because – when I came into the field, I was, go I was going to school, I was going to Lehman College to get my BA, and I saw a notice for the, the, the job as a care worker. I went through the training, and it really left a good impression about what happens when you receive the right training. So then I realized not a lot of people get good training. So once I was a residence manager, I saw that a lot of people coming in without the proper background and training. So I, I thought, well, why not try to set something up with a a training program or community college and so the rest is history it's been 20 years and it's been uh, going well at the uh, educational opportunity center which is also a part of bronx community college over here in uh, bronx new york now now um it, this has to do with uh with um you know people with special needs have you seen now uh, obviously, now group homes and other facilities have changed with the ADA compliance. I remember some years ago, you had a client, not mentioning names, uh, because your group home wasn't accessible too much, you guys had to put her into a nursing facility, a nursing home. Now, question, does the role of a DSP or service coordinator or anybody that works in the field of special needs change um, when it comes to a, a person's age, if a person uh, ages out or gets older? Well, the role of a DSP is to wear different hats, to, uh, to be an investigator, to be uh, an advocate, uh, to be um, an assistant, to help to teach the person to... Uh, to mentor the person, and also to, to keep your eyes on, like you said, the person as they age. So there are regulations that are there that are put in place to safeguard the person with disability in the group home. So, for instance, one of the requirements is to safeguard everybody that's there. You have to do fire drills on a regular basis, and usually it's on a quarterly basis. So you have to do fire drills. So you do a fire drill, 
and the person now is having ambulation issues because they're getting older. So at some point, if the person can't go from wherever their living quarters are or wherever they're sitting and go out the door, that presents a problem. So there may be a case where if a person can't evacuate mm -hmm. at a specified time, they may have to be considered for alternate placement. And oftentimes, uh, the state, at least in New York State, doesn't like placing people into nursing homes. Not that nursing homes are bad or anything, but they would rather have them go into a similar setting that doesn't have like restrictions, ambulation uh, restrictions. But it, it's hard because in New York, it's hard to find uh, one level or cottage house, cottage houses that have no stairs. But ultimately, if a person is deemed to be um, unable to evacuate, then at some point they may have to go into a nursing home if that's the only alternative available. Or, or, or some other type of facility, uh, you know, because right. besides right. nursing homes. Um, go ahead, Arlene, you have any more questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Louis, do you, see, do you have a lot of young people taking your, your class? You know what? It's actually it's actually a combination. The last class that I recently had in 2019, before this epidemic really came on board, I had a senior member, and when I say senior, I think the person uh -huh. was in in their um, late 50s or 60s. And then I've had some young people. I've young people as young as in their late 20s or middle 20s, and then people in between. So it's usually a mixed uh, crowd that comes in for the class. The average age is like in their 30s to 40s. But recently, it's been mixed. Do you... Uh -huh. Go ahead. Uh, do you find... Um, now, it, do you find um, that people continue your class and move on to um, other positions other than a DSP? Or do some of them leave or they, they can't do the coursework? How, how does that... Because it, I know there's a lot of training to be a DSP. Yeah, but what usually happens is when, when a person goes through the program, because it goes on for about a period of over two months, and the reason it goes for two months is that there's uh, medication training that's required, at least in New York State, that, that goes on for four days. There's a behavior, behavior intervention training that goes on for three days. There's CPR on first aid, and oftentimes we also get fire safety as well as the classroom instruction. So usually when the person stays for the period of the training, which is like I said, two months, and they get placed, they usually go on and continue on in the career path. And I have seen people become um, supervisors, managers, social workers. I, I've seen people even go on to become and elevate their um, career, career ladder status to a director because they've gotten their master's. So this is a field where you can go in different directions. You can become an administrator, a residence manager, a physical therapist, a nurse, a psychologist. Um, administrator. There are different things you can get into um, in a career path in this field. Mm -hmm. What? Um, Did you pay for the car? No, and at least now, from what I see, either through the Educational Opportunity Center or through the SUNY system, because so the SUNY uh, system is actually making it available to their students as well. Usually it's a tuition free program that's provided through grants and other means, but I have not seen that. There, there was one school that was doing it through a workforce um, where you had to pay, but I haven't seen that become very successful. Most of the programs that come through the EOC, the Education Opportunity Center, are usually tuition-free to anybody. Now, are there more men than women in the field of working in, the, in, in, in as a direction professional? Or Go ahead. Not, not necessarily. The women are more uh, known as caretakers. Men are starting to come in, um, but the, the, it's more leaning towards having a higher population of women working in the field than men. But um, if, if you're a person uh, that has a brother or sister, and you're a brother, and you have a person in your family that has a disability, and you wonder how to take care of that person, what happens is you get into the field, you start working, and then you pass it on to your friends. And they listen, you know, I have a good experience working in the field, and so that draws in other men into the field, because usually word of mouth goes a long way. But still, overall, usually we have a higher concentration of women working than men. Mm -hmm. um, why is that? Why is that? Yeah. Why is that? Um, because it also has to do with marketing the uh, field itself. Because you know and you hear more about 
CNA, certified nursing assistant, home health aide, security guard. You you can you, you know you can get on the understanding of those fields, but when you go out and you try to talk to somebody about the direct support professional, I don't they somehow get it wrong or they just don't understand what the requirements are. So usually that's where we attract more women because men don't understand the the nuances or the little things that you do that can actually help you become a better person. So it has to do with how we put it out there in the community, and that has to do with marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, now, in terms of titles, uh, PCA, uh, nurses aide, uh, what is the difference with all the titles? Because I know titles have changed, but what is the difference between a, a DSP and a personal care assistant? Because with a PC, with a DSP, sometimes you might have to give the person a bath or a shower, if I'm not correct. Uh, I mean, I mean, um, if I am correct. So, what is the differences, and and how do you differentiate uh, 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 differentiate the titles? Well, the personal aid may be a title that's used in other states, but uh, um, here in New York State, it's direct support professional, and then you have. Community, community habilitation worker, which usually is referred to COMHAB, and that's somebody that goes into the home of a family member to teach a person with disability. So it's a COMHAB worker, direct support professional. A respite worker is a person that, in New York at least, will go into a family's home, take the person out for recreational trips. So for us, yeah, personal aid, to me, it sounds like that's a person that's more like either a COMHAB worker or um, a, a recreation uh, person because... Um, here, they're more known mostly as ComHab, respite workers, and direct support professional. But a, a personal aide sounds more like a ComHab worker, at least from what I understand. Now, uh, why why isn't the is there a main reason why you, you know do you tell your students that this is a not, a not high paying field, and why isn't it a, a high paying field? It's not, it's not yet a high-paying field, although the, the salaries have gone up. Um, it, it's not because uh, we have to under, let on the society and, and people understand that there are a lot of challenges. This is not an easy job where you go in and you just have fun all the time. And sometimes you're dealing with some maybe serious behaviors. You're dealing with a person that has specialized needs. Um, and the community at large or the politicians or the people out there that are providing the funding – don't realize that the one thing that a person who has a disability needs is consistency of care and the right care to help to help them become more independent. So right now, it's, I think more than anything else is lack of awareness on the part of the powers that be that provide the funding. Because if they really truly understood the different challenges that the direct care or the, or the direct support professionals have, they would provide more funding because there's a lot involved. Yeah. Do you say? Do you think, in your opinion, that uh, certain states just don't care about their workforce? No, it's not. It's not that they don't care. I think they had. They need a, a different perspective of what it is to provide services to a person with a developmental intellectual disability. I think it's lack of awareness. If 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 you had a maybe a political person that work in the office and it's just mostly just doing calls or just doing what they do, go into a group home setting uh, and do work maybe for weeks or months, I think maybe they would understand it a little bit differently and then they would pay more attention to the needs of both the individual with disability and the staff that provide services. Uh, we have uh, co- just go- a question. Go ahead. Does the DSP really know how to handle um, someone with emotional behavior? Well, yeah, that's why, like I had mentioned, the other trainings that are aligned with uh, the classroom instruction that I provide. To give even a simple Tylenol, we can't do it ourselves. We have to do it under the guidance of a nurse. So that's what they call the AMAP training. It's an authorized medication-approved person. So there's a four-day training that a person takes to understand the, the different uh, procedures of giving medication, side effects, and so on. And then also for the behavioral part, there's what they call a skip training, strategy no, no, of crisis intervention but, and prevention. Yeah. And but what if... To help a person with a disability that has behavior uh, for the staff to understand how to get them to calm down in a diffuse situation as well. No, but what if the person has a real... Uh, uh, a real... 
a real mental health issue. Well, that's where it is. It's, it's a team. It's a team setting. It's not one person taking it on themselves. You're talking about you have the support of the residence manager, you have a social worker, you have psychologists, you have mistress. A DSP, when in, when in the case of a serious behavior, can't absorb everything by themselves. They work in a team environment with families and with us to say, listen, what is the best course of action? Um, how do we give this person the needs that they, uh, how do we support the needs that they have with the behaviors? Does it require medication? Does it require uh, some other uh, guidance? So yeah, because you can't, you can't, not, go ahead. Go ahead. No, but I'm saying you, but but if it's a real, like for example, here in Vermont, there's something, there's an agency called Washington County Mental Health Services. And if a, if a person is acting out, sometimes the police would be, be called in to to help help the person calm down. The, um, a screener, a screener. A screener or, or somebody, but like, does it, but what if the, uh, okay, so my point being, so if a DSP goes into somebody's home, for example, and if it becomes too dangerous, do they go to another client? How does that work? Well, if it becomes too dangerous, then you have the team, that agency that um, kind of aligned the person with the family to work there coming in to do some, some kind of diagnostic uh, evaluation. Can the DSP continue to work? If they can't, then the recommendation would be for, like what you were saying, for that, that individual to get more psychiatric assistance because maybe it's not what the DSP can do for that person. So at some point, if a person has serious, serious behavior, there may be um, hospitalization or some other interventions that go above what a right. DSP can do. Mm. Have you ever dealt with, uh, Lewis, have you ever dealt with someone with emotional behavior? Yeah, well, I ha I've worked with somebody when I was a residence manager that had psychiatric issue, and she had uh, hallucinations, and um, she required wow. hospitalizations because she would get um, a butter knife or a knife and try to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we would have to call... And we would have to call the ambulance and they would, you know, take her into the hospital for uh, intervention. So, yeah, I've worked with people who have psych psychiatric issues. Hmm. Well, we would like to... Um, yeah. How is it pretty dramatic? must be pretty dramatic for you the first time. No. Oh, it is. It is because when somebody has a bipolar disorder uh, episode or some other psychiatric issue, it, it's hard for them to manage that. And then at some point, they usually... A person will catch themselves and... I've had a person who had psychiatric issues apologize afterwards and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, and so this is why I say we think we're teaching them, but they're teaching us because they're teaching us patients and how right. to work with them and how to be more tolerant and just understand more. Mm. Have you ever dealt with someone with schizophrenia? Yes. Yeah, and it's the same thing. They go through hallucinations and they go through certain things and you really have to be careful how you work with them, yes. Yeah, well, well, um, okay, we're, we're about we're about to end. Um, what is the future of the DSP field, Lewis? Well, the future is growth. Because um, right now, more and more, they want people to be out in the community, people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So it requires a good workforce that understands how to meet the needs of that person. So right now, uh, New York State uh, has opened up a new a residential setting, so that requires more staffing. Uh, same as uh, day programs, because if, if you open up a group home, they need a place to go to school to, so that means you're opening up a new um, day program as well. And then also, families are, are saying, listen, we need help over here because my son doesn't want to go to a, um, a day program, so families need assistance having somebody go there. So right now it's growing, and hopefully it continues to expand, but it's also a place where there's a career path. Well, like I said, you start, you start as a DSP, become a psychology, a social worker administrator, and continue to grow. Well, we you know, I grew from a DSP into a manager and mm -hmm. now human resource director. Okay. Well, again, we would like to thank um, uh, Luis Torres for joining us, uh, uh, um, telling us about his experience and joining us on this edition of Able to Our Name. Um, Luis, um, what is yeah. the address and phone number of... Um, Equal Opportunity Center for people that might want to um, sign up for your class? For, for the Bronx COC, it's, it's in Bronx, New York, um, and the Bronx COC is located uh, at 1666 Bathgate Avenue, and the telephone number 
is 718-530-7000. Again, that's 1666 Bathgate Avenue, Bronx, New York, 10457. You can actually also go into their website and get information on the different trainings, and the trainings are tuition-free. And for those that would like to find out more about becoming a DSP and uh, training, you can also go to www.nadsp.org. That is www.nadsp.org. Well, we would like to thank our sponsors, Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, and uh, partners in this episode are um, uh, the Equal Opportunity Center of Bronx, New York, uh, Services for the Developmentally Challenged of Bronx, New York, and many others, including the um, including IAC of New York City and um, the Interagency Council of New York City. Uh, Tom McAvana, uh, thank him for um, helping us with this particular episode, as well as many others, including the help for um, the the Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and many others. Again, um, I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Abled in On Air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Abled in On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yachad New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Montpelier Sustainable Coalition. Able Dinner on Air has been seen in the following publications. Parkchester Times, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, and www.h.com. Able Dinner on Air, is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter.